Good morning, Radio Grove. Uh, it's another day that God has given us to bless to see another Easter Sunday. So we come with you this morning to read your scripture coming from John 20, uh, verses 11 through 18. And it reads, But Mary stood without at this pucker, weeping, and she, as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre and see it two angels in white setting, the one on at the right hand and the one at the left, at, at his feet, excuse me, with, where he, where the body of Jesus lay. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepeth thou? She said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seeketh thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, she said unto him, Sir, if thou have bound him, hence tell me where. Thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Mary, she said. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, Master. Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. And say to, unto them, I have ascended unto my father and your father, and to thy God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciple that she had heard, had seen the Lord, and the Lord has spoken to her these things, unto her these things. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearers of the word. Father God, we come this morning with thanksgiving, and I'm hard thanking you again for this privilege. We thank you for last night's sleep and this morning awaking. Father, we realize it wasn't because of our goodness, nor was it because of our righteousness, but by your grace. You said in your word, your grace is sufficient. We come this morning saying thank you, sir, for blessing us to see another Easter Sunday. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the year that passed by. We thank you for the new year have come here. We ask now that you bless and keep us in your keeping care. Lord, you know what we're standing in need of. You know our needs better than we ourselves. We ask you to look in on the sick, if you please. Cool their fevers and ease their pain. Lord, be the doctor in the sick room this morning. Those behind prison wall. We ask you to touch their heart this morning. Turn them around before it's everlasting too late. And then, Father, we ask you to look in on our pastor. Bless and keep him. Heavenly Father, keep him brave that he can stand bold and preach your gospel and teach your holy word. Bless the ministers of this church. Bless each and every one. And every church that stands in your name, every preacher stands to proclaim your word. Bless and keep them this day. In the name of our Lord and Savior, amen. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. What a blessing it is to be in the presence of the Lord this morning. Won't you all join us for praise and worship? Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Lord, I lift, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. 
Say, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name
So you clean me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I can be free So I can be whole So I can tell everyone I know Good morning, Great Oak Grove. Happy Resurrection Sunday, and I hope that you all uh, have had a a great week and weekend thus far. Uh, Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank thee for this day. Thank you, because we know that everything that we do in our entire existence is based on what took place on Easter Sunday morning. So because of that, we just want to pause and just express our gratitude for you loving us enough to give us your son. And then we want to thank you, Jesus, for loving us enough to give us your life. Now we pray that you would open up our hearts so that we may receive what heaven has to say. As always, I pray that you would sit Earl down, step in my body, say what you want to say, and say it the way you want to say it. And Lord, if there's somebody here Uh, listening uh, through whatever uh, avenues of communication they so choose, but they do not know you in the pardon of their sins, I pray that you would speak speak with enough clarity that they would want to get to know you for themselves. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to us uh, from the 20th chapter of the Gospel of John, and I want to thank Um, Deacon Mason for reading our scriptures to us. Uh, We want to focus again uh, on verses 11 all the way through uh, verse 18. But in your hearing, I want to reread it again just so that we can have it in our spirit. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. And as she wept, and stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had this said this, She turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Listen, Mary... She turned and said to him, Rabbani, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. And for a subject I want to use as for this topic is a bright side somewhere. That's what I want to share with us on today. In the midst of all that we've done and all that we've been dealing with, um, I thought it's appropriate for us to to know uh, that no matter how dim and how cloudy things may appear on the surface, there is a bright side somewhere. We've been, as a church family, been in prayer uh, for the last 10 days, and each day when we pray, we pray at noon and we pray again at 6 o'clock p.m. And prior to us praying, we always sent out a plea and asked, are there any particular prayer concerns that any may have. And all week we've been praying about 
the same things that many of us uh, probably been praying about, and that is for healing uh, of the nation, We're praying for leaders and first responders and those who are on the first line, uh, the medical professionals who are on the first line, uh, uh, to me, of action, uh, trying their best to take care uh, of those who can't take care of themselves. But there was one request that was made this week that stood out uh, to me. Uh, one of our young adults asked uh, that if we could pray for our sanity, and as small and as insignificant as it may seem at other times, to me it stands out because we try to deal with so many different things, but at this point, uh, our sanity is, is really on trial. And it's amazing to me how God, in his own way, took those words, that inquiry that was made to pray for our sanity, and took those words and lifted them from their original uh, context and then sat them uh, at my desk in my office and really put them at the feet of this passage. Because as whatever is going on that would want us to be concerned about our sanity, I think that we can find that issue even more pressing as we look at this present pa passage that we want to lift before you uh, on today. Uh, this passage is a passage uh, that really uh, comes to us on Easter Sunday morning. It, it comes to us in a different way than, uh, than, than the other passages that we read and studied and preached and heard and taught as it relates to uh, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. For three years, the disciples have been uh, walking with Jesus. For three years, they've watched him uh, do many miracles. They've watched him uh, as he laid hands on the sick. They've watched him as he's unstopped deaf ears. He's, as he put his hand on the tongues of those that were mute, and they began to talk. But now they're in a situation that they had not known before, at least in the last three years, and that is Jesus is no longer around. And in their minds, their minds probably reflecting about what are we going to do next. And I hazard to hunch that since we've all been dealing with this pandemic situation over the last three, four weeks, maybe even months, I think that we've probably asked that same question, and that is, what are we going to do next? And here, uh, this, this, this uh, passage, uh, to me, begins to unfold as it relates, because really to get, it, to get all of the meaning of it, you've got to read the, the whole chapter, beginning at, at verse 1, because it introduces us to, to me, the person that I want to focus the most on. It says in verse 1, now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the grave. And then you Bible readers know the story that uh, she just observed what happened, but she didn't go in. She ran and told Peter, and, and we know from reading the Bible uh, that Peter and John ran to the tomb, and John, being younger than Peter, outran Peter, got to the tomb first, but he waited until Peter showed up. But then as the verses began to progress, we see that they went there uh, together, and, and when John outran him, they looked, but they didn't see anything. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that it draws the attention away from Mary Magdalene, and then it focuses on Simon Peter and John, but then it quickly turns back to, for us to deal more with what's going on with uh, Mary Magdalene. When Peter came there, they saw the linen cloths. They saw them laying there where Jesus once was. But then all of a sudden, we, we come uh, to verse 10, and verse 10 says, Then the disciples went away again to their homes, which gives us an indication that 
they saw what they saw, but when they seen that Jesus wasn't there, uh, all they did was just left and went back to their homes. But then Mary is in, reintroduced to us in this passage, beginning at verse 11, it says, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. So the first thing that I see about uh, 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 the, the, what the Bible does is that it introduces us to this woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. And, and if, you, if you run too fast, you, 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 will, you, will, you will not really get uh, the full grasp of what it's really doing because uh, uh, over and over again we see that the Bible will mention characters, but uh, very seldom where they use uh, their, their whole name. And, and, and even here, as we, we look at this, it, they call, uh, the, the Bible writers call her Mary Magdalene, but, but, but in my studies, I, 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 I'm, I've concluded that Magdalene is really not her last name. So the appropriately, what it should read is that her name is Mary, and she's from Magdalene. And so what the Bible is doing is that, first of all, it's extricating her in the text, but it's also affiliating her. She, it's extricating her from in the text because what, what it's doing is that it's trying to give us a hint that this Mary is different from the other Marys. Because even in the final passage, uh, the final, uh, uh, the closing uh, uh, passages that relates to Jesus Christ, it often talks about how Mary and other Marys was all gathered together at the foot of the cross at Jesus, when Jesus died. And here it's letting us know that this is not Mary, uh, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, but this is Mary Magdalene, which surely, like I shared with us, is suggesting that this is Mary from a town called Magdalene. Now, to the casual reader of the Bible, it probably don't make sense, but I think that if we investigate what the Word is trying to teach us about this Mary, we will have a better idea of why she's so significant in the earthly ministry of the Master. She's, she's different, and, 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 and as I was reading this, uh, my mind did pause because as it mentioned who she was, I was concerned or, about who she wasn't because I feel like if it was anybody that should have been at the tomb, it would have been Mary, the mother of Jesus. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says it's Mary Magdalene. It, 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 it says, and the reason why I feel like it should have been a Mary, the mother of Jesus, because being a parent, you would think that the mother would want to be or want to have some idea about what's going on with her son, because if nobody else knew who Jesus was, Mary knew who Jesus was. But I also believe that the Holy Spirit does that because it was trying to address an issue that would come up later down in centuries after Jesus' birth because you still have some who want to have a tendency to want to deify Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I need to say to us today that just like although she had Jesus, she still needs Jesus. In other words, what I'm saying is that although she was the mother of Jesus, that she was not, she, 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 she's, a, she's, a, she's a person who needs Jesus like everybody else. And, and in other words, what I'm saying is that although, although Jesus was her son, he's also her savior. Uh, God fixed it so in, in his own a unique way that, that Mary needed Jesus more than Jesus needed Mary. Because when, when, when you think about it, uh, um, God allowed Mary to nurse Jesus, but it was Jesus himself who was giving her what he needed her to give him. You, you're going to catch that uh, maybe next week sometime. Uh, it, 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 when, when, when she would hold Jesus in her arm, it was Jesus holding her so that she can in turn hold him. And, and so you would think that's the Mary uh, that should have been there. But, 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 but then it, 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 it not only extricate her or differentiates her from the rest of the Marys in the Bible, but it also affiliates her from the place where she's from. 
uh, the place Magdala is a place uh, known as a town or tower, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it was about three miles from Capernaum. And then uh, the word is, is that this Mary from a town called Magdala, Magdala was one of the prosperous towns, it, one of the, the towns that was well-to-do. Most of the people in the town of Magdala was a place where wealth was found, which suggests that she was not somebody who was not well-to-do. She had, she had some sense of wealth, and also is what we don't read about it. It helps us to know something about her, because it does not say anything about her being a mother of, of any child or a wife of any husband. And so that enabled her to be committed to the ministry of Jesus Christ. But that's not really why I believe she was so dedicated to Jesus Christ, because the Bible teaches us it was this Mary that Jesus drove out seven demons out of her. Now, you got to think about this. The Bible says that he, this was the one, according to Luke chapter 8, that this Mary from Magdala was a person that came to Jesus, and somewhere in his earthly ministry, Jesus drove out seven demons out of her. I, I, I hope you don't fall asleep on me. He, he, he drove out seven demons out of her. And, and, and if you think about uh, what Jesus is do, doing here, it, 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 to, to, to drive out seven demons out of her, it, it would almost suggest that she had a demon for every day of the week. And, and the number seven is a number of complete, which is, suggests that her whole life was completely obsessed or possessed by these demons, but Jesus drove the demons out. And, and, and you all uh, are probably thinking that I'm, I'm, I'm reaching for something, but no, I'm not. I'm trying to get you to see the connection that this woman had with what Jesus had done for her, because uh, all of us, according to Romans, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And because of us coming short from the glory of God, that means that although because we're saved, we are not demon-possessed, but we are sometimes demons-obsessed, uh, uh, which means that every now and then we have a little hell in us. And, 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 and Jesus, uh, this woman, had hell in her every day. Wherever she went, she had these demons with her. But the Bible said Jesus, uh, Jesus drove these seven demons out of her, and to show her appreciation for what Jesus had done for her, she committed the rest of her life to spend time with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, you will see her name mentioned 14 times in the Bible, and in the 14 times that her name is mentioned, it's mentioned in connection oftentimes with other women, but they always list her name first, even before Mary, the mother of Jesus. And then out of the 14 times, five times is mentioned in the connection with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it is, it is, it is obvious to me that Mary is somebody. And, and, and I like the way the text begins to unfold because it, it shows us something that um, many of us probably don't pay a whole lot of attention, it says, because Prior to verse 11, it shows us the reaction of the men when they came to the tomb, but then it also shows us the reaction of Mary when she came to the tomb. It says that when John and Peter ran to the tomb, they looked in and they saw where Jesus used to be, and they left. You, you, you see what I'm saying? And then, but, but, but then it says that when she showed up, she, she stuck around because she was not satisfied with just the fact that Jesus wasn't there, she wanted to know where was he. And, 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 and I think that when, when you look at it, what, what, what you need to see is that Peter and John was in a hurry, so they didn't get the opportunity to see what she saw because she hung around because she wanted to know where was Jesus Christ. I, I'm not making it up. It says, and when she stood, uh, uh, when she stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, Stoo stooped, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and here is what the Word of God says, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And, 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 but, but, but the Bible doesn't say uh, that when Peter and John showed up, it just says that they saw 
the grave clothes that Jesus had on, but he took them off. But when, when she showed up, she didn't see, uh, uh, it didn't say nothing about her seeing the grave clothes, but she saw two angels. And I know that, that may not mean nothing to you, but if you draw in a little bit closer, and, and, and I want you to see uh, uh, something else. She, she, first, she, she sensed his absenteeism, but then she saw the angels. And, and what's unique about this text is that it says she saw the angels, and one was sitting at the head, and the other was sitting at the feet. And, and so what it suggests is that if you remember the Ark of the Covenant and in the middle of the Ark of the Covenant set the, 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 the holy seat and at the holy seat you, you, you have, uh, uh, at the mercy seat, what you have is you have uh, two cherubims and the Bible said one is at the foot and one is at the head. So it is like now that we about to enter into a new covenant and, and, and as if the Bible through the Holy Spirit is sharing with us that the old covenant is passed away and the new covenant is now on the scene. She see these angels sitting one at the head and one at the feet. And to me, it seems like they ask her to me a strange question from a, in a cemetery. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And, and this seemed to be, to me, a strange question to ask somebody in a cemetery. Because most often when people go to the cemetery, they're going there to look at a place where the remains of their loved one once was. And so it seems natural to me, to me, for to see somebody in a cemetery weeping. But, but then they, they, they said, and, and she responded and said, she said, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. In, in other words, what Mary was saying is that the last word we had was, this is where they buried. And now we're showing up, and I, I'm showing up where he was, but I don't know where he is. And, and then it says in verse 14, now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And I think that this is natural for us to understand what they're going through. For the last three days, Jesus has been nowhere around. The, the last time she saw him, he was hanging on a cross with nails in his hand and rivets in his feet. A pierce had been uh, uh, jugged through his side and a crown of thorns was on his head and he had been laid in this borrowed tomb. But now she don't know where he is, but the, the word of God says that he's there, but he does not, she does not know that it was him. But, but then the good news of the gospel is in, in, verse, in verse 15 and verse 16, it says, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She's supposing him to be a gardener and said to him, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him. I will take him away. But then verse 16, and this is something, this is the verse to me that is short, but, but it's got some shouting in it. Because the word of God said, Jesus said to her, Mary. I, I know I missed you, so let me back up and, and, and say it again. Uh, uh, she, 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 she hears a voice of somebody talking and, and don't know who it is. In, in her mind, she thinks it's a gardener. And then all of a sudden, Jesus says her name. It, 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 you, you're not getting it. it he, 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 she's, 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 she's hurt. She's, she's losing her mind. She, she's, she's dealing with some temporary insanity, and, and her heart is broken because Jesus, who drove out seven demons out of her, and she's committed her life to him, and now she shows up, and the tomb is empty, and uh, uh, who she thinks is a gardener uh, that's there to clean the tomb up is talking to her, but, but, but then all of a sudden, she, he says, Mary, which means that in the midst of our storms, in the midst of our darkness, in the midst of things not going like we wanted to go, Jesus knows our name. And, and the reason why he knows our name, because according to uh, John chapter 10, it says that the shepherd knows the sheep voice and the sheep knows the shepherd voice. So at this time, she does not she does not know her shepherd's voice, but thank God that when we don't recognize his voice, he still recognizes our voice. She said, Mary, and then she turned and said to him, Rabbi, 
<laughs> which is to say teacher. And, 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 and if I had time, I'll, I'll walk you through it because uh, there's three words uh, 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 that, that when, when they were talking about rabbi and, and one, uh, uh, rabbinai, but rabbi is the lowest term and rabbinai is the highest term. So what she's saying, she's not just missed up her words and it just, it's not that they confused what she was saying when they wrote it out. They're, they're letting us know that when she says rabbinai, she's giving him the highest honor you can possibly give a teacher. She says rabbinai. Then look at what Jesus says in, in verse 17. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. So let me back up and not want you to see what, what's going on in the text. Number one, she heard Jesus' voice. And, and faith cometh by hearing. We're in a situation now that we're not able to meet because of social distancing and, and, and everything else that, that, that's going on. But, but, but I need to tell you that, uh, uh, that, that the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. And, and so the word says, that she heard the voice of Jesus. But, but then something else happened, and, and I like this. Uh, the word says she saw the Savior. And, 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 and I'm glad that, that, that she saw him because when she saw him, what it meant to her is, is that he now has allowed her access to God because he's now keeping the promise that he made before he left. And so by her seeing the Savior, she was now understood that everything he said he was going to do, guess what? He did it. He, he, she, she now has access to God, and the reason she has access to God, because now she has atonement from the Son. Uh, 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 she, she, she got access to God because she has atonement from the Son. In, in other words... Uh, 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 him driving the demons out of her wouldn't have meant nothing if he had stayed in the grave. But, but all of the other promises that he made, he kept them. And, and the only way he could keep them is that he had to get up out of the grave. And the evidence of him getting out of the grave was the Bible shows us that when she heard the voice of the Savior, she also saw the voice of the Savior. And I, and I don't, I don't want to get into I don't, I don't want to get into uh, uh, the, the sexism of the text, but, but I think it's worth noting that uh, men are the one that put Jesus on the cross. But it was a woman was the first one that saw him when he got out of the grave. I, I, I don't have time uh, to deal with that. But, 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 but let me just say this, because I want you to see uh, what happened. Not, not only did he keep his promise, uh, uh, the promises that he kept, and, 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 and I think that's enough for, for all of us in here uh, 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 and, and you who are looking at me to shout about because the very fact that he got out of the grave means that every promise that he made before he died, he kept it. He, he said that I'm going to tear this temple down in three days. And, and, and I'm going to tear this temple down and in three days I'm going to build it up. And, and the only way he could have kept that promise, he had to get out of the grave. You, you're still not feeling me. Uh, in John chapter 14, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I am, there ye may be also. If he does not get out of the grave, he does not go to his Father's house and prepare a mansion for each and every one. He kept his promise. But not only, that's not all that I see in here, and not only with her seeing her Savior proving that he kept his promise, but also it displayed his power. And, and we've been dealing with a whole lot of power uh, around here. We got uh, political power, and, and you've and you got uh, 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 machine power, but, 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 but Jesus it displays to me ultimate power, and the ultimate power that he displayed is that Whenever you're in any situation, and I don't care how bad it may appear on the scene, nothing that you go through is harder than raising up a dead Jesus on an Easter Sunday morning. And if nothing that you've gone through is harder 
than raising up a dead Jesus on an Easter Sunday morning, he's already proven that whatever you're dealing with, he can handle your problem. Can, can, can I tell you that he's got power? He, he's got conquering power because he conquered death and the grave. So if he got conquering power, guess what? And, and you need to tweet this to somebody else. He also has coronavirus power because if he can conquer the grave, he can conquer corona. Amen all by myself. And, and, and so, uh, isn't, it, isn't it interesting to me, and, 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 and I'm all through, uh, it, it's interesting to me that how God has slowed everything down to make us pay attention to the cross, Calvary, and the resurrection. Can, can you think, think about it now, that you had, you, you, you've got this situation where people, people have been dying since the beginning of time. But now all of a sudden, those who were insignificant, and, and let me say this, and the only people we get news about that die are those who are famous, those who are entertainers, those who somehow make some significant contribution to the world. But now people are dying, and even though we know nothing about him, now the whole world is getting some information that whenever they die, they mean something. Isn't it amazing that how all of those years ago that the only people that had any idea about Jesus' death was those that was around in that region. But guess what? This morning, preachers all over the world are now talking about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I say to you today that I don't care what you're going through. I don't care how dark it may seem. If you understand what Easter is all about, there is a bright side somewhere. The Mighty Clouds of Joy was famous for when they recorded that record. They say it's a bright side somewhere. And then they would say it's a bright side somewhere. And then they said, don't you stop until you find it. There's a bright side somewhere. God bless you and happy Resurrection Sunday. Amen. What a mighty message from the Lord this morning from our pastor. There's a bright side somewhere. And you may be sitting in your living room or however you're viewing this message. And you don't know which way to turn. Uh, can't go to work. They don't want you going to the grocery store. But there's a bright side somewhere. And as he said, you just got to keep on looking till you find it. So we need you this morning. There will be a message on our screen broadcasting. If you don't have a church home, uh, you can look on our website. We invite you to be a part of this family uh, over at Great Oak Grove. And our doors are open right now. Uh, we're going to pray a prayer for those who are going through. We're all going through right now. It, the world was already dark, but it's even darker with the coronavirus. But the Lord has gave us a message this morning that if he can conquer death, he can conquer the coronavirus. Amen? Amen. Let us go to the God in prayer. Father God, we just come thanking you right now for being God and God all by yourself. Thank you for the word. Remind us that's the bright side. We just got to hold on and hang in there. Lord, we can't thank you enough because you continue to bless us in spite of our shortcomings. Lord, with the pandemic going on, Lord, I already know, Lord, that you know about it, Lord, before it even happened. Lord, we know you allowed it to happen, Lord. But, Lord, right now, as the total keep rising, Lord, we, it, you can stop it at any time. It's in your will and in your plan, Father God. So we thank you right now, Lord. Thank you right now, Master, for just doing everything that you've done and that you're going to do, Lord. We thank you right now, Lord, for the message this morning, Lord. Let somebody that don't know you, Lord, turn their life over to you today, Lord. We know you can only if you will. Let your will be done, Lord, because it's about your will, Lord. It's about your son who died on Easter, Lord. But that's not the end of the story, Lord. He got up with all power in his hand on heaven and earth. Jesus, thank you for dying in our stead. Thank you for shedding your blood, the only blood that could cleanse us from our sin. And Lord, your blood is going to cleanse this coronavirus, Lord, because your blood still works. And we thank you right now all over this land and country, Lord. Bless like we know you can, Father God. You've been mighty good to us. You continue to wake us up, Lord, and start us on our way. 
We thank you for allowing us to see another day, Lord, in 2020, April the 12th in 2020, Master. We thank you for this day, Lord. You've been mighty good, Father God. Continue to keep us in your keeping care. Lord, we have nobody else to call on, Lord. We can call on our politicians, but they can only do so much. Lord, sometimes we can call on our family members, and they, they won't even answer their phone. Lord, but I know we can call on you, Lord, and you will answer, Lord, our call. You might not answer when we want you to, Lord, but there's a saying that you're always on time. And I'm a living witness that you're always on time. So continue to bless, Lord. Continue to allow us to think safe and be safe, Lord. As this pandemic keep continue to spread, Master, we know you're still in control. We thank you, Lord, for just being God and God all by yourself. Don't know how to stop thanking you, Lord, because you didn't have to allow us to be on top of the ground. But you did, Master, and we thank you right now. Thank you for this service and every service that's sent up in your name. Lord, somebody meant it for bad, but we know you turn it out for it to be good, Lord. And, Lord, we know you're a good God all the time. All the time you're good, Master, and we're just thanking you right now. Thank you for all you've done and you're going to do. I pray this prayer in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen. To our members, wherever you are, we want to invite you now. Uh, to participate with us in our Holy Communion. So we want to give you a little time to um, get uh, your communion, and as, as you're doing so, uh, I want to take this time out to thank uh, the leaders of Great Oak Grove who have uh, taken time away from uh, their schedules and being with their family so that we can provide this communion by way of drive through uh, to the communion these last few days, so I want to thank each and every one of them uh, for that. Amen. And now I want to ask uh, Reverend Harper if he would lead us uh, in a prayer as we bless what we're about to do. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Most gracious Father above, we thank you for your Holy Communion, Father. We thank you for the members that are taking up the Communion. And I ask each blessings on each and every person that is taking it up. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. On that night that Jesus was betrayed, the word of God said that he took the bread and he broke it after he had blessed it and said, take, eat, this is my body. You may take it now. Likewise, he took the cup, and after he had blessed it and said, This will show forth my death, burial, and resurrection until I return. Ye may drink ye all. The word of God says that after this was done, that they sung a hymn, and they parted out into the Mount of Olives. May God bless and keep you, and I pray that you have a wonderful Resurrection Day. Amen.